Growing up, parents got me a guitar. Said you could do anything, kid. You could go far. You could be the president, fireman, race cars. The sky's the limit, kid. So shoot for the stars. So I strum that guitar every day. Found the passion for music, never went away. I joined a couple bands and played a few shows. Tried to impress the girl in the front row. But soon enough, everything starts to change. As you grow up, nobody treats you the same. They try to take your future and make it real safe. You could be a doctor, accountant, or something sane. But yo, whatever happened to the sky was the limit. I fell in love with music, never thought it was a gimmick. I worked so hard on every tune and every single lyric. My whole identity depended on being artistic. Now you want to strip that away so you feel okay? Because if I make it to the top, what does that really say? That you shouldn't have given up, that you made the mistake. But if I fail, you feel much better about picking your lane, right? Yeah, things are gonna get better real soon. Yeah, I'ma just do me, you just do you. I swear it's gonna get better real soon. Don't let anyone tell you what you should do. I got a clear view. We're gonna make it soon. Just keep pushing through. Yo, what you got to lose? Yo, what you got to lose? What you got to lose? Got to lose. 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 Got to lose.
Uh, Jimmy Aiken is an internationally known author and speaker. He's the senior apologist at Catholic Answers, and he has more than 25 years experience defending and explaining the Christian faith. Jimmy's a convert and has an extensive background in the Bible, theology, church fathers, philosophy, canon law, and liturgy. Facing him this evening will be Dr. Bart Ehrman. Doctor? No, I've always wondered if Jimmy Aiken actually has a doctorate degree or if he just has a master's. I don't know. Ehrman is the James A. Gray Distinguished Professor at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He began his teaching career at Rutgers University and joined the faculty in the Department of Religious Studies at UNC in 1988, where he has served as the chair of the department and director of graduate studies. He's the author of many books, six of which have been New York Times bestsellers, and you can follow him, and all proceeds from this go to charity at the Bart Ehrman blog. Is that correct? Bart, at the Bart Ehrman blog. Ladies and gentlemen, Jimmy Aiken and Dr. Bart Ehrman. The resolution for tonight's debate is the canonical Gospels are historically unreliable. Dr. Bart Ehrman will be defending the, excuse me, the resolution. Jimmy Aiken will oppose it. At each stage of the debate, Dr. Ehrman will go first. Gentlemen, if you're ready, I'll, I'll uh, get started. We all set? All right. Dr. Bart Ehrman, the resolution for this evening's debate is the canonical <laughs> Gospels are unreliable. You have 20 minutes for your opening statement. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you all for having me. Thank you, Jimmy, for doing this. I appreciate it. Um, how many of you are Catholic? How many of you think the Gospels are reliable? <laughs> how many of you want to see me get cream? <laughs> Very good. <laughs> yeah, I know what I'm up against. <laughs> well, it's a, it, is a real, uh, it is a real pleasure to, to be with you. And I, uh, uh, I, uh, I'm, I am not here to um, disabuse anybody of their faith or uh, to try and uh, deconvert anybody. Uh, I'm, I'm here as a historian who's been very interested in this subject for a very, very long time, for my entire adult life. So uh, this is the topic, are the Gospels, uh, his, it's a little bit confusing because we're asking about the reliable, but the resolutions, are they unreliable? So I'm debating that they are unreliable. <laughs> okay, so, so, anyway, uh, I want to talk about my key terms. The key terms in this resolution, as far as I'm concerned, are uh, first, uh, historically reliable. In this debate, I will not be talking about whether they are religiously, theologically reliable. They're not... I'm not talking about whether they're reliable about what you, you ought to believe about God or Christ or anything else. I'm interested in the historical question. Do they describe what actually happened? Uh, are they reliable? And when I say reliable, uh, do I mean are they entirely reliable, mainly reliable, partially reliable, not at all reliable? I think these are, you know, there, there are different ways to approach this. So, just to give my stamp on this, um, I would say that um, they're as historically reliable as almost any other text from roughly that time up to maybe a thousand years earlier. Um, I would say that both in history and reliability, um, I would say historically, uh, well, I would say theologically they're 100% reliable. I would say morally they're 100% reliable. I would say historically they're mostly reliable. Um, but you can write a fiction that's mostly reliable. So that's, hell, if you're a really skilled writer, I'm probably you can probably write a fiction that's completely reliable, which, you know. Um, like let's say you wanted to write a story about someone going through the pandemic you could you could write a very reliable story and just make it fiction so um yeah okay 
My questions are actually fairly simple. They are, if the Gospels say something happened, did it happen? If they, they say that Jesus said something, did he say it? If they say that Jesus did something, did he do it? Um, so if the Gospels say that something happened, did it happen? I'm going to say yes, but you have to take all of them in, in account, all four into account to figure out which one to figure out what exactly happened um and then uh if they say that it said something did he say it uh yeah for the most part um uh, and then if it, they say that he did something did he do it i would say yes i would say this one is the strongest yes this one's the next strongest yes, and then this one's the weakest yes. And so those are the questions I want to pursue uh, with you, and I'll, I'll start by telling you my basic, my basic view of the matter. Uh, my basic view is that the Gospels do contain significant historical information. And I agree. Uh, I, I'm not a complete skeptic. I, I think that the Gospels describe the man Jesus as a Jewish uh, preacher in Galilee who talked about the coming kingdom of God and that he gathered disciples. And You know, I wish that they were debating not just the Gospels, but they had included Acts in that debate um, because I think there would have been some more conflict there between Jimmy and uh, Bart. Uh, and... Uh, he went to Jerusalem the last week of his life during a Passover feast and uh, was turned over to the authorities and was crucified. Uh, was crucified. I, so, I mean, the basic story, I think, is, is absolutely uh, reliable in the Gospels. But I think um, in addition to the broad outlines of the things that Jesus did, said, and experienced, there are large numbers of inconsistencies, contradictions, non-historical accounts that make these Gospels unreliable in many, many ways. There are lots of details that are unreliable, I think, in the Gospels, but I'm not going to focus on the details because they're, they're, they might be interesting if you really want every single word to be right. I'm interested in the major ways for this debate that the Gospels uh, seem to me to be unreliable, involving three big issues that I'll try to address in my time, issues connected with Jesus' birth, Jesus' resurrection, and Jesus' teaching or preaching. Okay, so that's what I'll be talking about, those, those three areas. And I'm going to start with uh, the birth. Jesus was born to uh, the virgin in uh, Bethlehem. What are our sources of information for the birth of Jesus? Just in, in the New Testament. We, do, we don't have sources from outside the New Testament that are going to help us much for any of this material. We, we're restricted to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And what are our sources of information about Jesus' birth? In, in just in the New Testament. Well, we have an account of Jesus' birth in the Gospel of Matthew, chapters 1 and 2. We have an account in Luke, chapter 1 and 2. Those are the only passages in the entire New Testament that talk about Jesus' birth in Bethlehem to a virgin. That's interesting. Matthew and Luke don't talk about the birth outside of those first two chapters. They don't refer back to it. And what about other sources in the New Testament? They don't mention it. The virgin birth, of course, is a huge, huge doctrine in the history of Christianity. Um, in, in my part of the world, in the American South, uh, evangelical, Protestant evangelicals often say that if you don't believe in the virgin birth, you can't be a Christian. Why aren't there other parts of the New Testament that even talk about it? It's an interesting question that I think a lot of people haven't thought about. Why, why isn't there any account of Jesus' birth in our first gospel, the gospel of Mark? I also find it weird that in defending this, Jimmy Akin is kind of tying his hands uh, from being able to use the magisterium or holy tradition as an argument for these questions being uh, for a source of reliability or historicity on, uh, on these claims. It's interesting that they chose this topic. 
Why isn't there one in the Gospel of John? Why doesn't he say anything about Jesus being born of a virgin? What about the Apostle Paul? Why doesn't he talk about the virgin birth? There are 13 letters that claim to be written by Paul. There's not a word about the virgin birth. There are 25, 27 books in the New Testament. 25 of them don't say anything about it. That's interesting. Well, why? The bigger question I'm going to address, though, is how do we explain the differences between the two accounts that we do have? There are lots of differences between these two accounts. People don't realize this because, you know, we, we hear the Christmas story every year and we, we sort of smash it all together in our heads. But when you actually read the accounts, it's pretty interesting. Read Matthew's account and just make a list of what happens. Then read Luke's account, make a list of what happens, and then, read, then compare your two lists. Very, there are lots of differences. Many of them may not matter to you. Um, Matthew has the wise men coming visit Jesus. Luke has the shepherds. Uh, Matthew has Jesus' family escaping to Egypt. Uh, Luke has them, the presentation at the temple and the circumcision. They, these are differences, but you know, well, they're just different. That doesn't mean they're contradictory. There are some potential problems, though, some potential contradictions that I think actually are real uh, contradictions. They involve Bethlehem and Nazareth. Similarity, Matthew and Luke both agree that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, but that he was raised in Nazareth. Nazareth is about 100 miles, 80 miles, 100 miles north of, uh, of uh, Bethlehem. Discrepancies in these two accounts. This one I'm not going to go into, but if you want to look for yourself, just look at the two genealogies, one in Matthew chapter 1 and the other in Luke chapter 3, and ask yourself, who actually was Jesus' grandfather? Was it Jacob or Heli? And who was his great-grandfather and his great-great-grandfather? The different genealogies all the way back to David. Is Jesus descended from David's son Solomon or David's son Nathan? Depends which one you read. So that, that's interesting. Just look for yourself and you'll see. I'm more interested in the question of why Bethlehem and why Nazareth, according to these two accounts. So here's how it works. Matthew chapters 1 and 2. In the Gospel of Matthew, Joseph and Mary start out in Bethlehem. Mary gives birth in Bethlehem, and there's a star that is leading the wise men to, uh, to Jesus. The wise men are coming from the east, and they follow this star, and the star apparently stops over Jerusalem. They go into Jerusalem and ask, where is the king of the Jews to be born? And the inquiries get to the king, King Herod. Herod asks his wise men, and not his, his, uh, his scripture scholars, to tell the wise men, and it turns out that the scriptures say that the, uh, the king of the Jews is to be born in Bethlehem. And so the wise men then follow, the star reappears somehow, and it stops over the house. That's interesting. It stops over the house that Jesus is being born in. How does the star stop over a house exactly? Go out tonight and look up at the stars and tell me, which house is that star over? Huh. And it doesn't do much good if it's a comet or a supernova or anything else. I mean, you know, so it can't be really a star. It must be something else. But that's fine. Uh, what happens, though, is they come in and worship Jesus, and they offer their three gifts. They go back to, they're going to go home then, and they learn by an angel that they can't go back to Jerusalem to tell, uh, to tell Herod because he's out to kill the child. And so they go some other way, and Herod sends out the troops to kill the child. They, they, they kill all the children. The troops kill all the male children in Bethlehem, the slaughter of the innocents. That, by the way, is a very interesting story. There's no record of that, there's no record of that happening in any ancient document other than this. You would think that would, would be in the newspaper. Uh, Joseph and Mary learn that the Herod's after the child, and so they escape to Egypt. They, they get out of there to escape Herod, and uh, they, they go to Egypt. And of course, you know, if you're, if you're going to Egypt from Bethlehem, you got to walk. I mean, you can't, you, you can't take a train. <laughs> and so, uh, so it takes a while to get there, and they're, they're in Egypt until Herod dies. When Herod dies, they, they start to return, but they realize they can't go back to Judea, where Bethlehem is in the south, or what we think of as Israel. And so they relocate to Nazareth. And that's why Jesus is born in Bethlehem and raised in Nazareth in Matthew. Luke has a very different account. In Luke, Jesus, uh, Joseph and Mary start in Nazareth. That's where they're... So, uh, I know that on uh, Catholic Answers, Jimmy has explained the differences in, in very well, actually, in both literary and theological terms. I, if I recall correctly, he doesn't do a very good job here. Um, Synthesizing, resynthesizing them for this argument. Um, hmm. They're from, 
And it turns out there's a worldwide census. The Roman Emperor Caesar Augustus has decided that the entire world has to register for a census, and so everybody has to go to their ancestral home. David goes, uh, I'm sorry, Joseph has to go to Bethlehem to register for the census because he's from the lineage of King David. And King David came from Bethlehem. Now, this is a very weird phenomenon just on the surface of it. Uh, how is it that everybody, what? I mean, Joseph was a thousand years after David. Everybody's going to where their ancestors were a thousand years earlier to register for a census? According to Luke, it's the census of the entire world. Well, that can't be right. It must be the Roman Empire. Okay, the entire Roman Empire. Everybody's going to their ancestral home from a thousand years earlier? How does that work? I mean, suppose, suppose, suppose the Democrats just really take over everything next time. <laughs> And they decide, you know, we all need to register for a tax, because you know how much they like to tax people, and so, you know, they got to go register. For you. And you've got to go to register for this tax. You've got to go to where your ancestors came from a thousand years ago. Where are you going to go? Really? And the entire population is doing this, and it doesn't get reported in the newspaper? There is no record of this anywhere, except for Luke. Well, Mary gives birth in Bethlehem, and uh, eight days later, Jesus is circumcised, and then... Uh, then 32 days after that, they go to the temple to present a sacrifice as commanded in the book of Leviticus, chapter 12. So it's 40 days later, and then after that, 40 days after birth, Mary gives her offering, and then they return home to Nazareth. Wait a second. In Matthew, they flee to Egypt. How do they go home 40 days later in Luke if they're on their way to Egypt? And they stay in Egypt until Herod dies. And then they can't come back to Judea because the next ruler is worse than Herod. And so this is months and months, years? I don't know, but Luke says they went back 40 days later. How can that possibly be right? They can't both be right. The deal is, is that either one of them is right and the other is wrong and therefore unreliable, or they're both wrong and therefore both unreliable. They both can't be right. They can't be right. Hello, let me tell you about my new obsession. Ay, ay, ay. I hate commercials. Okay, let's let that play out. So, you know, when, when I was, um, I think I have this book, I think I have a, a book of his, an audio book. And, uh, and I know I've taken several of his courses. I, I don't, I, I can't remember if it was one of his, uh, the courses that he offers online, not like a real class of his. I always have to clarify that every time. Uh, but um, I've always, you know, it, it's not very um, controversial or striking as a Catholic when, when he points out these differences. Um, it's just not. So I, I never understood why he's highlighting these differences. It, it's not as if Protestants can't read. <laughs> They're kind of known for reading the Bible. So um, I'm not sure what pointing out these differences does to the Protestant that he's talking to. Like I'm not sure what the effect is. Because they can clearly read. I, I mean, the, there's literally, you know, the, there's there's very famous Bibles that have four different pieces all put together, uh, and you can read them side by side. And there's even ones that have the parallel Gospels all put together. So I, I don't understand how this is supposed to be shocking when he says this. Maybe I'm missing something. I'm not sure. Oh, uh, let me read a comment in the chat. I'm sorry about that. A friend of mine has been calling me and I, I got distracted. Uh, this is from Sela. Salam. Peace. Uh, that was an intellectual bravery that you are known for from your reading Engaging in Islam, Holy Book of the Quran. Uh, give your honest opinion, but I hope you will complete it. Um, I, I did finish the Quran, uh, my friend. Uh, I um, I finished it off screen uh, because uh, when I was doing that original series, uh, I lost over a thousand videos uh, and I didn't want to redo it. Uh, 
And then I re-upped the series, but it wasn't as popular when I did it the second time around because the algorithm had changed. So the videos weren't being watched by anyone. So I didn't finish it um, in that way. I did a recap series instead. And then I did a summation series where I just kind of said my final thoughts on the Quran. Um, what I did is I did both an audio book and then I got a different translation and I got a different uh, tasir, uh to um, to finish it out. Uh, I, I stopped going to the hadiths because it was taking too long to read it that way. Um, but um, I wouldn't mind talking about Islam again. I, I do actually have a plan for this channel that includes going over all the major world religions. Buddhism is up next. I already did Taoism, and I'm gonna I'm gonna return to them secularly. Uh, but lately, there's been a lot of hot topics in Catholicism and Christianity, so that's where I've been doing these episodes but i do plan to discuss islam again on this channel uh, but what i'm doing is I'm, I'm dedicating different weeks to different religions that i'm talking about and then anytime a hot topic like this comes up jimmy aiken's going to have a debate with uh, james white and i just want to revisit this debate to see how to see if, if jimmy aiken really has the stuff to uh, to defeat james white in an argument um I've watched a lot of James White's debates. I, 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 I kind of got a feel for them. Uh, so I, I really want to see in Jimmy Aiken's performance here against someone who I respect greatly in Bart Ehrman to see how he does. Uh, even though I've seen this before and I made a video about this a long time ago, this is me actually watching it and live reacting. We have uh, four accounts of the resurrection, and there's some broad similarities. Jesus dies on the third, he buried. Third day, when to go to the tomb, find it empty, you learn that he's been raised from the dead. Basic, basic similarities, but lots of differences. Lots I'll of be right back. I'm going to let it play, though. Matter. To illustrate, how do the disciples of Jesus learn that he's been raised from the dead in each gospel? Simply read them yourselves, you'll see. In the Gospel of Mark, we're explicitly told that the women go to the tomb. They learn that he's been raised from the dead. They are told to go tell his disciples that he's been raised and he will meet them in Galilee. And the women fled from the tomb and they didn't say anything to anyone because they were afraid. Period. The Gospel stops there. They didn't tell anyone. That's the end of the Gospel of Mark. In Matthew, uh, well, I should put Matthew here, Matthew, Luke, and John, the women go to the tomb, they hear that Jesus has been raised, they're supposed to go tell the disciples, and they go right away and they tell. Well, which is it? Where do the disciples go if they go anywhere? Mark and Matthew, Mark presupposes that they're supposed to go to Galilee. Matthew says they go to Galilee, and that's where they meet Jesus. But in Luke, in Luke, the women hear about Jesus being raised, and then Jesus appears to two followers the same day, we're told. The women go tell the disciples. And while they're talking to the disciples, Jesus shows up on the same day. And then he takes them out and he tells them, don't leave Jerusalem. In the south. Don't leave Jerusalem. Stay in Jerusalem until you receive the Spirit. When you get to the next book written by the same author, Acts, they're in Jerusalem 40 days later. And they stay in Jerusalem after that. Jesus appears to them in Jerusalem. The same on the same told Jesus being Jesus supposes that they're supposed to go to Galilee. Matthew Sorry about that. A buddy mine's having Galilee, an issue. And that's where they meet Jesus. But in Luke, they go to the tomb. How do the basic similarities? But lots of differences. There are lots of minor discrepancies, and some of them matter. To illustrate, how do the disciples of Jesus learn that he's been raised from the dead in each gospel? Simply read them yourselves. You'll see. In the Gospel of Mark, we're explicitly told that the women go to the tomb. They learn that he's been... Anyway, what I was saying was um, I've, I've read and listened to so many of his books. And I haven't taken that many of his, of his online available courses, but I've taken enough that I've heard him say this stuff so often that I can't remember where I heard it from. <laughs> <laughs> which 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 avenue I, I've heard this information from him at this point. From the dead. They are told to go tell his disciples that he's been raised and he will meet them in Galilee. 
and the women fled from the tomb, and they didn't say anything to anyone because they were afraid. Period. The gospel stops there. They didn't tell anyone. That's the end of the gospel of Mark. In Matthew, uh, I should put Matthew here, Matthew, Luke, and John, the women go to the tomb, they hear that Jesus has been raised, they're supposed to go tell the disciples, and they go right away and they tell. Well, which is it? Where do the disciples go if they go anywhere? Mark and Matthew, Mark presupposes that they're supposed to go to Galilee. Matthew says they go to Galilee. You know, maybe he's pointing out the initial differences that he points out as a layup to these differences. Because those other differences, as I said, I mean, Protestants can read, so of course they know they're there. Maybe he's trying to get them to say yes, to agree with him on that there's differences before he gets into this stuff where hermeneutics, or hermeneutics and uh, apologetics almost demand that you uh, reconcile all these apparent contradictions. Maybe that's his approach. Uh, and that's where they meet Jesus. But in Luke, in Luke, the women hear about Jesus being raised, and then Jesus appears to two followers the same day, we're told. The women go tell the disciples, and while they're talking to the disciples, Jesus shows up on the same day, and then he takes them out, and he tells them, don't leave Jerusalem. In the south, don't leave Jerusalem. Stay in Jerusalem until you receive the Spirit. When you get to the next book written by the same author, Acts, they're in Jerusalem 40 days later. I'm curious if Dan McKellen, I didn't even know Dan McKellen existed when I watched this video last time, last time I watched this debate. I wonder if he, because I know he has a problem with saying Luke wrote Acts. I wonder if he believes that Luke and that the book of Luke, the gospel of Luke and uh Acts was also written by the same person, or if he also disagrees with that, uh, with that hypothesis. And they stay in Jerusalem after that. Jesus appears to them in Jerusalem and tells them not to leave, and they don't leave for months. In Matthew, they go straight to Galilee. How could it be both? It can't be both. Where do they see Jesus? Do they see Jesus anywhere? Not in Mark. In Mark, the women don't even tell anybody. In Matthew, they see Jesus only in Galilee. They make a trip up to Galilee. They go up to Galilee. They're in Galilee. They see Jesus, and then he leaves them. In Luke, however, they see him only in Jerusalem, and tells them, Jesus tells them, don't leave Jerusalem, and they stay in Jerusalem. They see Jesus, and then he ascends to heaven. Well, which, how can they, just read them yourself. They differ from each other in a way, in a way that can't be reconciled. How can all of these accounts be right? So we had a couple. <clears throat> you know, what's interesting is that the last time I, I watched this, which was when it originally aired, I think that was a year ago, if not two years ago, um, I was very disappointed that Jimmy Aiken didn't tackle some of these. I mean, obviously not during his opening, but during his rebuttal, that he didn't tackle some of these issues more directly because on Catholic Answers, he has tackled these answers and tackled these questions and done very well. I don't know if that his, his standard answers just don't stand up to um, scholarly uh, criticism, so he didn't want to open up the, a can of worms that he couldn't close. Or if he was just off his game because he doesn't debate very often. I don't know. But I wish he had uh, answered them the way that he does uh, on Catholic Answers. I wish he had treated Bart Orman more, more like a caller and less like, um, almost like a celebrity. He's, he's very gentle with Bart Orman, which is very weird for any kind of debate. Uh, there are lots of things we could say in a way that can't be reconciled. How can all of these accounts be right? What about Jesus preaching? Uh, there are lots of things we could say about Jesus' message. Uh, and for this, just for this, because of the short amount. And, and to answer something else that Selah said, uh, I do... Uh, 
use the same amount of criticism and even more on the Bible. While I believe in the Bible and I consent to the Bible, I, I use just as much criticism, if not harsher criticism, on the Bible than I do the Quran or any other book. Uh, I will do the Book of Mormon, and I know I'm going to tear it up. I know I'm going <laughs> to... I'm going to beat the crap out of that book because <laughs> it's, it's, it's just stupid. But understand that I will still have higher criticism and, and I will still cut more sharply when examining the, the Bible. Uh, while I won't make fun of the Bible and I might make fun of the Book of Mormon, um, I genuinely hold that same level of criticism for everything that I read, uh, regardless of whether I agree with it or not. It's just the Bible can, luckily for my faith, withstand all of my criticism. Uh, and I appreciate the Bible for that. <clears throat> anyway, continuing. I just want to talk about what Jesus said about himself. What does Jesus teach about himself in the various Gospels? Well, I'll start with Matthew, Mark, and Luke. As you know, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are, uh, as you may know, they're, they're, they're very common. They're very, they're, they have a lot in common, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So much in common that they're usually called the synoptic gospels. And synoptic means you can see them together. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke are so similar. They tell so many of the same stories. I do feel one of the mistakes that Bart Ehrman does is that he doesn't really tailor his argument uh, for the audience that he's speaking to. He's speaking to Catholics. Um, I wish he had addressed Catholic claims uh, more so than uh, evangelical fundamentalist claims. Um, I, I know that Mythvision, I think in their last uh, live stream, actually, or the, the, the Diablo Click or whatever they call themselves, uh, talked about how the Western definition of religion seems to match evangelical uh, Protestantism. <clears throat> and more so Western evangelical Protestantism, or maybe even American evangelical Protestantism, so that limits the that limits what can and can't qualify as religion. <clears throat> and I do hear them a lot speaking in Protestant terms, uh, and that upsets me a lot of times because religion is much older than that. Catholicism, Orthodoxy is much older than that. Judaism is much older than that. Uh, the uh, the Vedas, the everything that I'm interested in, uh, Sanskrit, all of that is way older than American Protestantism. So uh, I do think I am saddened uh, that even the scholars who are supposedly, you know, atheist or secular can't get out of a Protestant mindset um, and and. That does bother me. It, it honestly does. Um, I, I have been wanting to engage because I'm sure I have biases. I'm not. I'm not stupid. I, I, I realize that. I've been wanting to engage and debate a Catholic skeptic, someone who comes from Catholicism, is educated in Catholicism, not someone not not Glasslingen, but someone who's educated in Catholicism, who has left the faith who could debate me openly and challenge me on my beliefs and, and on my uh, thinking. Uh, and it's, uh, it's very frustrating that even uh, the sharpest minds I can find, whether it's Dan McKellen or, or uh, Joshua Bowen, they're attacking, if not a straw man, at least a wooden man of Protestantism. And, as a Catholic, I do that too. I also attack Protestantism. I try to attack a stillman version, but I haven't always done that. There are earlier videos on this channel where I'm just, and excuse the French, I'm just shitting on uh, Protestant uh, ideals and Protestant, well, not ideals, but Protestant concepts um, as being late coming, as being uh, antithetical to the Christian message. So I, I, I do really wish. Um, I really do want to talk to, to an ex-Catholic uh, who's educated in Catholicism, not someone who holds crazy beliefs about Catholicism, not, not someone who comes from cultural Catholicism or folk Catholicism. Um, yeah, that might never happen, but I, I, I do want to have that conversation one day with someone. Story. Usually in the same sequence for 
accomplish this and this and this and this, and often in the same word, word for word the same. But you can put them in columns next to each other and just and read and compare them to each other because they're so similar. And John is very different. But the, the, the difference is really quite striking when it comes to Jesus' message in particular. What does Jesus preach about in the Synoptic Gospels, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke? Well, the dominant theme by far, you'll see if you just read them, just by far is Jesus preaches about God and his kingdom. God's kingdom is soon to arrive on earth. You need to repent and prepare for it. The very first recorded words of Jesus are in Mark chapter 1, verse 15. The time has been fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. God's kingdom is almost here. Get ready for it. And throughout his, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, he's telling people how to get ready for it. Turn back to God. Obey God. Love one another. Love God. Because the kingdom's coming. What does Jesus say about himself in these Gospels? He does say that he has to go to Jerusalem and be rejected and executed and that he will rise from the dead. What does he say about his personal identity in Matthew, Mark, and Luke? About coming down from heaven or being a divine being? or being, What does he say about it? Nothing. He will, if somebody calls him the Messiah, he'll tacitly agree to it or at the end uh, actually agree to it. Uh, he'll agree he's the Messiah. He will... Uh, and so there are things, but in terms of what does he say about himself, so people can say, well, who are you? Uh, well, you know, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it's not something he talks about. What about the Gospel of John? In the Gospel of John, that's all he talks about. He doesn't talk about God and his coming kingdom in the Gospel of John. Jesus talks about who he is, his identity. For example, the I am sayings in the Gospel of John. These are the most distinctive sayings of the Gospel of John where Jesus identifies himself. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the resurrection. And again, this is a problem with him not tellering his audience, um, tellering his, his arguments to his audience. And I think even James White um, argumented, uh, argumented, argued uh, uh, or complained about that in, uh, in his post-debate, uh, in his follow-up from his debate with Bart Ehrman, is that he, he didn't tailor his, his argument to a Calvinist argument, an argument against Calvinism. Uh, Catholics have no problems thinking or saying and claiming that John is a later writing with a developed, that's written for an audience with a developed Christology. We have no problem saying that. So Bart Ehrman is wasting words here uh, as far as the debate is concerned. Like I said, I, I thought Bart Ehrman won this debate. Uh, I'm not saying uh, otherwise, um, but if Jimmy Aiken was coming with his A game, I think this is a, a bad approach. If I didn't know what what, a what Jimmy Aiken's about to say already, uh, I would I would say that this was this right here is a mistake. It's it's an incorrect. You're aiming at the wrong audience. Unless he's so disrespectful to all audiences that he just thinks all Christians are crazy and he doesn't care what our individual differences are uh, in our understanding of these things. That could be it, too. And the life. Jesus talks about himself as the one who has come from the Father to earth to reveal the truth so people can know the truth about him so that they, they, can, they can have eternal life. That's the entire thing in the Gospel of John. And sometimes these I am sayings are really quite striking because sometimes he simply says, I am. In the Old Testament, in the Exodus, book of Exodus, chapter 3, when Moses asks God, what is your name? God says, I am. Tell them that I am has sent you. That's the name of God. In the Gospel of John, Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. Whoa. He's claiming to be God. And the Jewish opponents know that. They take up stones to stone him to death. Uh, these are pretty, pretty uh, interesting claims. Uh, one, place, one place Jesus says, the John 10, 30, the Father and I are one. They pick up stones again. Chapter 14, Philip says, Lord, show us the Father. Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus is claiming to be God in John. And he never claims that in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. That is interesting. Is this a contradiction? No, this is not a contradiction. Uh, he might have said something, you know, said different things at different times. But it doesn't seem to me to make any sense. Scholars for a long time have recognized that Matthew, Mark, and Luke are based on earlier sources. Sources that provide these Gospels with their material. Mark itself was probably copied by Matthew and Luke. Matthew and Luke had some other source. You might have heard of a source called Q. It's a, it's a hypothetical source, but it appears to be a source used by Matthew and Luke. 
you know, one of the things that, that's kind of weird is that um, I don't know if Bart Ehrman's opinion on some of these claims have changed in the last few months. I, I listened to his, his podcast and, and, and that kind of thing. Or if um, maybe some of his uh, associates just don't agree with him on this view, but I, I've heard I've heard people associated with Methvision and people associated with Bart through Digital Hammurabi uh, kind of shoot down the the God claims of uh, of Jesus. So I, I'm not I'm not sure if maybe his view has changed on this or. If there's a if there's a nuance there that some of his associates um, are are just not are the, they're shorthanding uh, the way that they speak and they're not mentioning the nuance when they're uh, when they're speaking on these same topics. I don't know. Like I said, I didn't even know that those channels existed when I was when I watched this debate last time. So I'm not going to pretend to know uh, to know that. For their, many of their sayings of Jesus, like the Lord's Prayer, for example, or the Beatitudes. That they're not in Mark, but they're in Matthew and Luke. They had a source, Q. Matthew is some of his own stories, the wise men. And so that's a separate source. They call it M for Matthew's source. Luke had a separate source for his stories, like the Good Samaritan, call it L. None of these sources has Jesus talk about himself or call himself God. Mark, Q, M, L, Matthew, Luke. These are earlier than John. If Jesus spent his ministry talking about himself as a divine being, calling himself God, if you knew that, wouldn't you want to mention that part? These six sources don't even mention it? That seems to me odd. I think John is not reporting what Jesus really says. In short, are the Gospels historically reliable? I don't think so. Thank you. <coughs> Whoa. <laughs> oh, yeah, I hate all these commercials. And they're so inappropriate for like a religious debate. <laughs> um, okay. I'm obviously not going to do a three hour stream tonight, so we are going to go through all of Jimmy Aiken's opening statement. And I don't know if we're going to jump around or if we're going to make this a three night event or something like that. Um, I guess it just depends on how many of y'all watch this uh, over the next 24 hours. Because I stream at the same time every night uh, between 10 and 10.30. All right, uh, let's get to the Jimmy Aiken stuff. For opening statement. Wait for the uh, PowerPoint to switch over. There we go. Okay. I feel bad for Bart because I didn't realize we were going to have the screen way over there. So I'm going to angle my laptop so you can follow along. That's great. Thank you. Okay. So first of all, thank you everybody uh, for coming. Hope you're having a great evening and I hope to make it greater if possible. I, uh, I want to apologize for that because that's kind of a spoiler. I probably should have given you a spoiler warning first, but uh, it is uh, what we're uh, debating tonight. And uh, Bart has made a few specific challenges to play. I, I really do think Jimmy's opening joke that he's about to do was poorly timed, and <laughs> I think he, um, I think he gives up too much ground too early. Even if he doesn't contend anything against what uh, Bart Ehrman's saying, I think this first. I'm going to call it anti-salvo, uh, was a mistake. I hope he doesn't do this with uh, James White. Places in the Gospels where he thinks they contain errors, or at least things that are odd, and I'll be happy to talk about those later, like in our cross-examination period or in the audience question period. But what I need to do right now is give you a sketch of the big picture. So, as Cy mentioned, our debate uh, resolution is that the Gospels are historically unreliable. And you might wonder, why put it that way? Well, normally, what will happen, at least very frequently, what will happen in my experience, is skeptics will come to believers and demand that they prove the Gospels are reliable. Why should I believe those Gospels are reliable? But I think it's healthy to look at questions from both perspectives. And so I think it's healthy, once in a while at least, to have skeptics bear the burden of proof and show why a believer 
should say that the Gospels are unreliable. So that's what we're doing. <laughs> this giving away of the game thing, and I do it too, and I do it because I probably do it because of how long I listened to Jimmy Aiken uh, before I converted into Catholicism. I, I listened to uh, Catholic Answers for years uh, as a as a lapsed Catholic. Like I, I would go out of my way to make sure to hear every to hear Rush Limbaugh and to hear Catholic Answers. Like those were the two shows I was definitely going to hear. Um, <laughs> it's funny. It's when I wasn't. I wasn't a uh, a Republican. Well, I, I guess I was a Republican. I wasn't a conservative at the time, and I wasn't. Um, I definitely wasn't a practicing Catholic at the time. So it's just funny. Tonight, now in a debate, at least a formal one like this, the person who agrees with the resolution has the burden of proof. So Bart agrees that the Gospels are unreliable. So Bart must show tonight that the Gospels are unreliable. I only have to show that Bart hasn't proven his case. We need to talk for a moment about the difference between reliability and inerrancy. Reliability is something we all have a gut sense of. You know, when something is reliable, it means it works, at least most of the time. But what about inerrancy? It's kind of an unfamiliar term to some folks, but it means if a source is inerrant, it means that it contains no errors. It's 100% accurate. And I, I don't remember how, uh, how Jimmy Aiken squares this circle because Catholics do believe in inerrancy as well. Yes, we believe in 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 infallibility and in inerrancy. Uh, we're more concerned as Catholics with inspiration, but we don't deny the Bible is true. So I'm very curious how, because I can't remember how he did it, how he tries to square the circle. And I, if I'm not mistaken, I don't think he's completely successful. Fundamentalist Christianity, they have a particular interpretation of inerrancy that's very common that would say the Gospels are inerrant in such a way that they, for example, have a word-for-word -word transcript of everything that Jesus says is exactly, there's no paraphrasing going on, and not only Jesus, but everyone who talks to Jesus or everyone who says anything at all in the Gospels, we always have a word-for-word -word transcript, and that's how they understand inerrancy. But there are more nuanced interpretations of inerrancy, and the Catholic Church has one. If you uh, want to read about it, at least at a kind of top level, you could go to sections 11 to 13 of the Vatican II document date. And, see, this is a problem for the debate, and I'm worried he's going to do this with James White. He said the the argument here is that the Gospels are reliable, not that the Vatican considers them reliable. Do you see what I'm saying? Uh, don't get me wrong. I agree with the Vatican. <laughs> I'm a Catholic. I, if I didn't agree, I wouldn't be a Catholic. Like, I reconverted in. Like, I, 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 I was an adult. I was 33 years old. I had time to do research. I had time to read everything all over again. I had time to study. I had time to research other religions. Like, I came in fully aware of all the potential paradoxes and, and contradictions and everything, and I still said yes. But I don't think that's necessary for this debate on this topic. It's, it's something that I myself end up having to do. If you go back to my debate just uh, this weekend with um, B.S. Lewis, uh, you know, I, I keep on going back to the Catholic stance and, and having to differentiate the Catholic stance from the Protestant stance. Fine. But Jimmy Aiken, who has more book knowledge than I have, assumingly more education than I have, and has way more experience than I have, I don't think has to set up the layup like this. And I think Bart Ehrman does a very good job of either ignoring or countering what Jimmy's doing here. And I'm not sure how this is going to, how if he chooses the same approach, because he debates so rarely, I don't, I don't know what he's going to do against Jimmy Aiken, uh, against, Jimmy, against James White on the same topic. Uh, I hope it's not this approach, because this was not impressive to me at all. I know there are Catholics out there who think that he kicked ass. I think you're just being biased and picking a side, honestly. I think you're just taking the side of your side. Uh, Jimmy Aiken's on my side, and I agree with what he's saying, but I don't think this was the right approach to this debate.
How many freaking commercials, man? This is unwatchable like this. I am not going to buy a subscription just to get rid of commercials, man. That's very upsetting. Question. How could we verify if the Gospels were inerrant? How would, you, how would you determine that? Well, for most Christians, it's a matter of faith. You know, we've seen evidence that leads us to believe in the Christian faith. We verify Dei Verbum. But we've got a question. How could we verify if the Gospels were inerrant? I mean, how would you, how would you determine that? Well, for most Christians, it's a matter of faith. You know, we've seen evidence that leads us to believe in the Christian faith, and we're taught as part of the Christian faith that the Gospels are Considering that the Catholic definition of inerrancy is completely different than the Protestant definition of inerrancy, I don't think bringing inerrancy into the argument was the correct approach. Because we acknowledge that there's anachronisms. We acknowledge that there's a human author. I don't think this was the correct approach. I just don't. And I can see a world where James White is going to use these arguments against Jimmy Aiken in their solo scriptura debate. Because he's going to say, well, look at what Jimmy Aiken said to, to Bart. So he doesn't believe any of this is true. He doesn't, when he's speaking about inerrancy, he doesn't mean what we mean. He's not a real believer. He's a Catholic. He's a Papist. He's a Latinist. He's a Romanist. I, I just, I think this was a tactical error. Not just with Bart Ehrman, but for future debates where people can go back and use this material against the Catholic position. And remember, that's what we're doing here. We're analyzing the debate. We're, analy we're analyzing Jimmy Aiken's performance. And so we accept that. But we're not here to debate faith tonight. As Bart said, we're looking at the Gospels from a historical perspective. And what a his so don't bring it up in the debate. Historian could make it. Well, from a historical perspective, if you wanted to verify that the Gospels are 100% accurate in everything they say, you'd have to go back in time and check to see if every claim can be verified with your own eyes. But without a time machine, you won't be able to do that. And so we're not debating inerrancy tonight. All we're debating is reliability. And reliability is a spectrum. You can have some sources that are 100% accurate, which would make them inerrant, or you could have some sources that are 100% inaccurate. Nothing they say is right. But our question is not a spectrum question. We're asking a yes or no question. Are the Gospels reliable or are they unreliable? So how would we determine that given that reliability is a spectrum? I mean, where would you draw the line on that spectrum and say, okay, if a document gets up to this point or higher, it's reliable, but if it's below this point, we're going to call it unreliable. Well, one place you could draw the line is right at the top, at the 100% level, and say, okay, unless a document is inerrant, unless it's 100% right on everything, we're going to say it's unreliable. But that's not how we use the word reliable in ordinary life. I mean, for example, most people have friends. I know I do. I assume Bart does. And we have friends that we would consider reliable. You know, they, they tell us what they think. They help us when we're in trouble. They show up for appointments. You know, they're reliable friends. But we don't, if a friend makes just one mistake, say, oh, that friend is, is fundamentally unreliable. He made one mistake. And so reliability isn't the same thing as inerrancy. So how can we say what it is? Well, if we don't put the line at the top of the spectrum, we might put it somewhere else, like, say, at the 50% level. Now, at that level, you could say, well, if it's above that, it's right most of the time, and so it's reliable most of the time. If it's below that... You know, I don't self-analyze when I'm reading anything uh, in this manner. I, I, I don't do a 50-50 split on... on, on whether the book is, is reliable. But if I was going to self-analyze, it would have to be the 50% line. It would have to be if it's 51% or higher, it's reliable. If it's 49% lower, then it's unreliable. That would be the way that I would do it, but that's not, that's not the way that I read a book. That's not whether it's fiction or... 
even in, in a fiction, like I'm looking for a fiction that ha contains truth, that relates truth. I want, oh, that's true. You know what I mean? Like, oh, that's so true. Oh, that's so right. Oh, that's how that would happen. You know what I mean? Like, like, like I want to say those things when I'm reading a book. And if I'm not saying those things and I don't find it believable and there's no suspension of disbelief, then the book is going to be trash. And if I can solve the mystery or it takes too long to get to the mystery, then ugh. You know, um, so... Don't wrong. You, you can... You can... Predict the, the ending of the book. You can foresee all of that. But I just... I don't, I don't think this is the right approach to, to this debate. And look, I will admit, I, I've, I've only debated two or three really heavy hitters in, in, my, uh, in my time on YouTube. Most of the people were either at my level or a little bit less. And I know that, and they know that. And we're, we're, we're playing a game of trying to build each other's channels up by, sh by showing off to our audiences and to each other's audience that we're worthy of... of uh, of a subscription <sighs> but Jimmy Aiken's not doing that here he has a super large audience he is the most looked at apologist like he's the person that priests and, and, and bishops go to for answers regardless if he's a doctorate or not uh, so I I don't know um, I don't like. I don't like this. I, I just. I don't like this. That level, it's fundamentally unreliable. Or you might. Uh, you might say, I want it to be higher than that. I mean, I wouldn't consider a friend who's reliable half the time. It feels like he's talking down to Bart Ehrman. I know that, that it's, 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 but it feels that way. It feels like he's talking down to Bart Ehrman. I'm to be a really reliable friend. So you might put it elsewhere. You might say, put it at the 75% level or at some other level. But there's a problem because as we noted, if you want to assign a percentage like 100% to the reliability of a document from a historical perspective rather than a faith perspective, you're going to need a time machine. And that was the moment that I realized that You know, that gives me a second to, to continue what I was saying. Um, it, it feels like he's talking down to Bart Ehrman. And for anyone who's identifying with Bart Ehrman's argument, or with Bart Ehrman himself, uh, based on his humor and the way that he's talking, it's then going to feel like to the audience that you're talking down to the audience. So uh, I just, I don't think this is a way to win a debate. Time machine means no way to go back and check out all these claims, and thus there's no way to establish some percentage and say, well, if it meets this, then it's reliable. So we can't use percentages as a way of measuring reliability. We have to do something. But Bart Ehrman talks about probability. And I don't remember which one of his books that I read that talks about this but you're looking at possibility and probability and, and you're 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 going to use Occam's razor and you're going to you know th there's a lot of stuff that you're using to figure out what's true and what actually happened because you don't have true eyewitness accounts you're having acetations testaments uh, claiming that this is what happened um and they're anonymous on top of that, so it makes it even harder to, to to use reliability of the author. I just I, I feel like like Jimmy Aiken's losing or unhooking the people who would who he would normally pull in with the arguments that he gives on Catholic answers. With, with better performances I've heard him give. Something else. So what can we do? Well, I would note that, that documents tend to make 
different kinds of claims. Some of them are major claims, which deal with the most important facts and themes and events that the document discusses. Some of them are intermediate claims, which are not the most important, but still important facts, themes, and events. And then there are lesser claims, like individual details and minor themes and events. And I yeah, but you look at something like Death of a Salesman or... Um, oh, I can't remember the book right now, but it's one of the Jane Austen novels uh, where it's just a lady talking to a friend as she's traveling to her house. It's, one, it's like a super short novel. It's, it's not even a novel. It's like a short story. These things can be made up even though, yeah, it is very possible this conversation really did happen. You look at something like uh, one of my favorite movies, um, before Midnight or Before Sunset, whatever it's called, uh, with Ethan Hawke and, and, Ju and Julie Depley. That first movie, I don't know, I'm not talking about the, the sequels, that original movie, it's taking place in a real place, it's taking place in a real time, they're talking about real topics, that really could have happened. That could be an absolutely real thing and it's absolutely fiction. So, anything can be made up. Anything. So I, I I don't I don't like this argument because anybody can make up a very realistic story with no fantasy with no fictionalization involved even though it's completely fiction. Okay. I would propose, in light of that, that a source may be judged historically reliable if we can verify many of its major claims, many of its intermediate claims, and many of its lesser claims. So if we can check it out and show, wow, a bunch of its major claims and intermediate claims and lesser claims, they're accurate, then we can judge it to be historically reliable until we've seen enough errors to counterbalance this. So if you see a picture like this, with lots of verified claims on the major, intermediate, and minor levels, then you can judge that document historically reliable. Now, of course, you need to understand how to read the document. Like, if it's an ancient document, you need to know how ancient sources work so you can interpret it correctly. And I'll have more to say about that in my second statement. But for the moment, let's look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and see what we can determine about their reliability. Well, here's a list of major claims that the Gospels make. Jesus existed. Jesus was a Jew, he lived in the first century in Roman Palestine, he had a reputation as a teacher on both moral and prophetic subjects, he gathered disciples, including an... The problem is this list is arbitrary. You could just as easily make a list of all the miracle claims, or make a list of all the contradictions. Uh... circle of 12 disciples. He was crucified, and the man who put him to death, the man who ordered him crucified, was the Roman governor Pontius Pilate. So, how can we... Uh, I, if I'm not mistaken, this is just all the claims that Bart Ehrman himself makes about Jesus. So, that, that's all that Jimmy Aiken's doing. Uh, oh, but it's an arbitrary list. We evaluate these claims. Well, I'd love to be able to present you with all the evidence I'm aware of. But I've got 11 minutes left in this opening statement. So um, I'm going to have to do something else. And fortunately, we have with us tonight Bart Ehrman. See, he's right up there. And he's also right here, incarnate, as it were. So what does Bart Ehrman make of these major gospel claims? Well, one thing, as a historian, he's not going to say that a historical document ever gives you absolute certainty about what happened in the past, but it will give you probabilities. And so even though he wouldn't say that we have ontological certitude that certain things happened about Jesus, he will say the Gospels are probably right about some things. In fact, he already said it in his opening statement. And sometimes he'll say they're very, very probably right. So what about that first major Gospel claim that Jesus existed? Well, Bart Ehrman says that's right. In fact, he wrote a book called Did Jesus Exist? 
where in which he combats mythicists. Jesus mythicists who say Jesus didn't really exist, he was just a myth. Bart wrote an entire book refuting that point of view, and I think he deserves credit. Well, let's give Bart a big... I think this was another tactical error, the clapping and the being kind of a shithead. I don't think Jimmy A can complain that pool. He's way too polite throughout this entire um, debate. So I think doing a move like this is a little dirty and not cool. That being said, I do think it's good that he went to Bart as his as uh, as his source for this stuff. But. Bart could just easily say, he could dismantle this whole argument by saying, well, I changed my mind. Since that time, I've had a different opinion, and here's the new evidence that I have. That's all it takes. You're giving way too much power and way too much authority to your opponent. And I know for a fact he won't do this with with James White. At least I hope he doesn't. But yeah, I, I, uh, this is not good. Big hand of applause. Hello. Let me tell you about my new obsession. AFK. I hate the commercials. It makes this unwatchable. Thank you. And this is something that Bart and I agree about. Jesus really existed. High five. Yeah. So, Bart agrees that Jesus existed. What does he think about these other major claims? Well, uh, without making too long of a point of it, he thinks that the Gospels are right. When they say Jesus was a Jew who lived in the first century in Palestine, who was a teacher on moral subjects, on the high fiving, the over aggression. I just think Jimmy Akin's just awkward around people and maybe uh, a little antisocial. You know, I, I get it, but don't don't do that. Don't do that with James. Don't do that with James. Prophetic subject gathered disciples who had an inner circle of and i really do mean don't do that with james you every time laden flowers does it it just makes laden flowers look weak don't do this with james white don't be playful don't be touchy feely don't shake his i mean you can shake his hand but don't give him a high five and don't stop your speech to physically touch him you know what i mean keep that distance and and, and be more professional disciples who was crucified and who was sent to his crucifixion by Pontius Pilate. So Bart agrees on all these major gospel claims. But what about intermediate claims, things of a slightly lesser scale in the gospels? Well, uh, the gospels say that Jesus was lived in the first century, but more specifically, they indicate he was an adult in the AD 20s. Bart Ehrman says that's right. The gospels indicate Jesus lived in Roman Palestine, but more specifically, they say he came from Nazareth. Bart says that's right. The Gospels say Jesus was connected with John the Baptist. Bart agrees. Jesus was baptized at the beginning of his ministry, according to the Gospels. Bart agrees. John the Baptist was one, the one who did the baptism, and Bart agrees. What about John the Baptist himself? Well, uh, the Gospels indicate that John preached a message of coming destruction and salvation. Bart says that's right. The Gospels also indicate that Jesus agreed with John the Baptist's message. Bart says that's right, too. Jesus not only was a teacher, but one of the ways he taught was in parables, according to the Gospels. Bart says that's right. One of Jesus' major themes in his teaching was the kingdom of God. And Bart said that, in fact, in his opening statement. Jesus believed that he was the king of that coming kingdom, or the Messiah. And Bart says Jesus did believe that. Jesus taught that there was a coming reversal of fortunes, where the exalted would be humbled and the humble would be exalted, according to the Gospels and according to Bart Ehrman. Jesus didn't think that you needed to scrupulously observe the Mosaic Law in the way that some thought you did. Bart agrees. Also, Jesus believed that the heart of the Mosaic Law was the love of God and the love of neighbor. Bart signs off on that too. And Jesus believed that the way to attain the kingdom was through love of God and neighbor. Once again, the Gospels and Bart agree. Because Jesus' teachings were different than other Jewish teachers, Jesus was in conflict with them. He also spent much of his preaching ministry in Galilee. But at the end of the ministry, he went to Jerusalem for Passover. And he predicted the destruction of the temple. And he was betrayed to the Jewish authorities. He had a follower named Judas. Judas was the man who betrayed him to the Jewish authorities. <clears throat> the Jewish authorities then handed him over to Pilate. He's succeeding way too much ground to the authority of Bart Ehrman. Way too much ground. 
Unless he's like trying to call him a hypocrite, but if he is, he's not doing a very clear job of that. Pilate, and Pilate had him crucified for calling himself the king of the Jews. On all of these points, the Gospels are probably right, according to Bart Ehrman. So Bart not only agrees that the major claims we covered are accurate, but all of these intermediate ones as well. What about lesser matters of detail, you know, smaller stuff? Well, Jesus, unlike the Pharisees, did not interpret the Sabbath command as strictly, or degrees. Jesus did not, unlike the Sadducees, understand the temple rituals and sacrifices the way the temple cult did. Jesus did not think people, unlike the Essenes, did not think people should isolate themselves in order I just really disagree with this approach. He should be... Hi, Pixie. He should be... Um, he should be defending the Gospels at this point. We get the point. We didn't have to get to all this. We didn't have to do this many, many points. Maybe just do 10 of the top one, 10 of the middle, 10 of the other one. Make it 10 minutes of your speech total and then hit into it. Um. Oh, uh, hold on. Okay, I'm going to read Pixie's uh, message. She goes, you're going to think I'm terrible. But the first thing I heard was Pilate. So naturally, my first thought was the Pilate from the 70s, Jesus Christ Superstar. Um, but anyway, I, I just think, uh, I just think this is wasting so much time to show that, yeah, Bart agrees that the Bible is historically reliable enough for him to use as, uh, for him to go into mythicist channels and onto atheist channels and say that Jesus did exist. You could just say that and then start defending the actual text. And I know that Jimmy Aiken's playing a stupid game of, well, uh, that's not my job here. My job here today is to show that he can't disprove it. De do your job as an apologist and defend the text you're there to defend. So that way, Catholics and other people can see you win and can see how to do it. You're not doing that. <laughs> okay. In order to maintain ritual purity, Jesus said that the kingdom would be brought about by a cosmic judge called the Son of Man. Jesus said that the kingdom of God had already begun, even though it was still coming. Jesus spoke of leaving one's family for the sake of the kingdom. That's an individual saying of Jesus, so it's definitely on the minor scale of things. Jesus privately taught the Twelve that he was the Messiah. He did not, however, publicly proclaim that he was the Messiah to Jews in general. All Bart Ehrman now has to do is, do all, is mention all the places he disagrees. And then just what you're gonna make a list and see which one's higher, and that becomes what's that becomes the test of what's reliable or unreliable in the Bible is based on how much Bart Ehrman agrees or disagrees with the Bible. It's not good, and it's not impressive, and it's pedantic, and it's insulting. It's not till the end. Jesus, and the reason he didn't do that is presumably because Jesus did not understand his kingship as a worldly political one. Bart agrees with that too. The Gospels also preserve Jesus' sayings in the parable of the sheep and the goats. Jesus himself was the one who, who commissioned the Twelve. And another individual saying he told the Twelve, this one's only in Luke, he told the Twelve that they would sit on Twelve thrones judging the Twelve tribes of Israel. Jesus associated with tax collectors and sinners, and religious leaders mocked him as a result. Jesus had conflict with some members of his own family, and some members of his family didn't believe in him during his public ministry. This is way too long of a list. That trip he made to Jerusalem for Passover at the end, that was around A.D. 30, according to the Gospels and according to Bart Ehrman. He came to Jerusalem, though, not just for Passover, but a week before Passover, according to the Gospels, and Bart says that's probably right. Jesus proclaimed his apocalyptic message at Jerusalem at the end. He objected to the money changing and the selling of animals at the temple, and he, as a result, reacted violently and caused a disturbance in the temple. After the temple incident, Jesus suspected his time was up. But when he was handed over to the Jewish authorities, they didn't try him just according to their own law. They instead handed him over to Pilate, 
And they didn't have to go far because the Gospels say, and Bart agrees, that Pontius Pilate was in Jerusalem at the time. As a result, Pilate gave Jesus a brief trial. It did not go on for days or weeks. When asked if he was the king of the Jews, Jesus either answered ambiguously or in the affirmative, according to the Gospels and according to Bart. This is the man painful. Who died Jesus, Judas, died some kind of untimely death, and his death was somehow connected with a field in Jerusalem. That's only some of the things that in my reading for the debate, I discovered Bart found, thinks the Gospels are probably right about. So this is what we're looking at. Bart, the skeptic, agrees the Gospels are probably right about all these major claims, all these intermediate claims, and all these lesser claims. And that's quite a lot. I would say that this is enough to judge the Gospels historically reliable. Until we've seen enough errors to counterbalance this. And so we've got to weigh things. Well, tonight, Bart has proposed a few places in the Gospels where he thinks they contain errors. I don't think they are, and we can talk about that later. But for the sake of argument, let's give him those. I notice that they aren't major claims. He's admitted the major story is right. Instead, they're on some intermediate matters or some lesser matters. But fundamentally, this does not counterbalance this. And so I conclude, yes. The Gospels are historically reliable. Thank you. Uh, each of the participants will now have a 10-minute rebuttal. Dr. Bart Ehrman is first. Well, thank you, Jimmy. I'm, I'm, I'm glad I'm right about so many things. <laughs> it's nice to hear. It's been a long time in a debate where I've heard that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the, these rebuttals are the hardest part of doing a debate because you know we had no idea what each other was going to say, and so uh, uh, and so it, they tend to be a little bit complicated. I want to I want to say a, a couple of things. I uh, yes, the things Jimmy said that I said are right. I mean that's right. I mean I, I wrote a, in addition to the book Did Jesus Exist, I wrote a book called Jesus: The Apocalyptic Prophet of the New Millennium um, many years ago, and I laid out all of these things. And so that's no mystery. These things that these are so you know I'm obviously not going to disagree with them. Of course I agree with all of those things. Um, and yet, I think the Gospels are not reliable. But what does it mean exactly? Um, I don't think that it's quite right to say that the issues I pointed out are not major claims. If Matthew and Luke are not, they don't agree about the virgin birth. Uh, one of them's making stuff up or getting information from somebody who made stuff up, or they both are. And the resurrection, this is not a minor claim. This is a major claim. Uh, Jesus' teachings about himself. So I'm, I'm, I'm only talking about major matters. If you want to talk about lesser matters, I can assure you I can go all night uh, talking about small. Uh, Tux, I know, and a lot, of a lot of Catholics think that Jimmy Aiken won this debate. Uh, but in my estimation, Jimmy Aiken did a terrible job. Uh, absolutely terrible. Uh, he acceded way too much ground to uh, the opinions, not even, not even Bart Ehrman himself, but just to his opinions. And these are opinions that he held maybe 10, 15 years ago that are definitely subject to change. Um, and uh, it, to me, it's very painful to watch. Um, I'm, I'm not going to watch the whole debate tonight, but I, I am going to get all the way through Jimmy Aiken's uh, rebuttal to uh, Bart. Uh, but I think tomorrow night when we're doing the uh, the answer and question portion, per portion, there's like this one question that people are like, yeah, see, that's where Jimmy won the debate. If you see it, if you watch this tomorrow night and you see it, tell me. Because I don't see it. I, I don't see him winning the debate at any point. He, he just gives too much ground to, to, to Bart and gives too much power to Bart's authority as a scholar. Uh, anyway. And he introduced the whole infallibility argument, which is such a red herring and it has nothing to do with the historic... The, the infallibility argument has nothing... Or ins inspiration... I don't even remember. It's just... Inerrancy, infallibility, 
and even inspiration has nothing to do with historical reliability in this argument, in this debate. So just bringing it in there wasted time. And he wasted so much time by just saying how great Bart Ehrman is. <laughs> All he did was build Bart Ehrman up on the, on the Catholic side of things. <sighs> All details. Uh, the really lesser matters. Uh, the and they love it so much that now there's so many commercials on here, too. That's really annoying also. Why is there a contradiction exactly? Um, so it's an interesting way of kind of sketching it out, that if you get these major things right, then it's reliable. So I was just trying to think while Jimmy was doing that, because I, I didn't know he was going to be doing it. But it just occurred to me that, you know, suppose I, suppose I tell you that um, there's a city, New York City, and it's the biggest city in the United States. It's everybody's favorite Spider-Man argument about to happen <laughs> by an actual scholar. An actual scholar is going to make the Spider-Man argument. It's located in New York State. It has a great theater district. There's a financial district. Uh, it, uh, and so I, I give like, big facts about New York City. You say, oh, yeah, that's basically reliable. But then I look at my sources. And one of my sources says that Manhattan has 6 million people in it. And another says it has 20 million people in it. One source says it's on the Hudson River, another says it's on the Mississippi River. One says it's 30% African American, another source says it's 80% African American. One says that the Empire State Building is in Manhattan, another says it's in Brooklyn. One says the baseball teams are the Mets and the Yankees, and the other said, no, it's the Dodgers and the Angels. Uh, one says that it's the headquarters of the CIA. Uh, one says that there's only one international airport there. And so, I mean, you could just go down the list, and uh, if we had more than 20 minutes, the, the list for the gospel would be very, very long indeed. Let me explain like, how this matters in terms of a big picture. In the Gospel of Mark, we have an account of Jesus' death that is one of the most moving stories in the New Testament. I'm talking about Mark's Gospel. The thing is to train yourself to read each of these Gospels individually because Mark has a message for you. And if you pretend that he's saying what... At this time, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Bart Ehrman was totally in love with uh, Mark's Gospel and he was just burying himself into it. At least if you believe what he was saying on his podcast and, and some of his appearances at that time. John is saying, then you're ignoring Mark's message to you. John has a message for you, and you can't pretend that John's saying the same thing that Luke is saying. Mark's account of Jesus' death is, is so compelling. Jesus is uh, turned over to the authorities. He goes before Pontius Pilate, and Pontius Pilate asks him, are you the king of the Jews? And the only thing Jesus says is, you say so. Mark, Sue Legge, you say so. And he doesn't defend himself. And he's condemned. And so he's taken off to be, to, to be executed. And he doesn't say anything the entire way. He's silent. And at, they nail him to the cross, and he's silent in Mark. On the plus side, it's given me plenty of time to talk. Oh, my crap. Uh, for my regulars that are in the chat, should I just buy a subscription to YouTube so I can stop having commercials? Is it worth it? Like, honestly, you guys have, some of you have known me for over seven years. Is my channel growing fast enough and am I improving enough in my uh, ability to communicate with an audience that it's worth buying a year subscription to freaking YouTube just so I can get rid of these commercials? Let me know in the chat, guys. I'm talking to Tux. I'm talking to Pixie. I'm talking to BS. You guys know me for a long ass time. Is it worth it? Both robbers, uh, both robbers mock him, and he's silent. People passing by mock him. The Roman soldiers mock him. Everybody mocks him. He's hanging on the cross. He hasn't said anything this entire time, as if he's in shock. In Mark's gospel, and at the very end, the only thing he says is. He cries out at the very end. He cries out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he dies. Whew. Jesus, at the end, appears to be in shock. He doesn't say anything, and he wonders why God himself has forsaken him. This is a powerful presentation. And the thing is that the reader knows why this is happening, even if Jesus in the story doesn't. Because right when Jesus dies, in Mark's Gospel, the second he dies, the curtain in the temple rips in half from top to bottom. And the centurion who's just crucified him says, sees how he's died. He says, truly, this man was the son of God. Jesus' death rips the curtain. The curtain is the, the curtain separating. 
Here's a little lore for my channel that uh, people don't know. Uh, Alpha Centurion, the reason why I'm going with the spelling that I am is because I'm going with a Roman Centurion. Um, I would love to say that it's the uh, Leginus, but uh, actually at the time uh, that I created this name for this channel, I was watching Doctor Who and uh, I really like Rory. Uh, yeah. Uh, the Holy of Holies, where God himself dwelt from everyone else. Nobody could go behind the curtain except the high priest would go once a year. And also I was writing a historical fiction at that time too, when I created the, the name. So it was on my mind. Here for the Day of Atonement and make an atonement for his sins, the atonement for the sins of the people once a year. He's the only one who could go in there. He could only go in there once a year. But now Jesus has died and everybody has access to God because of his death. But he's in doubt at the end. He doesn't know why it's happening, but you know, and God knows, that it's bringing salvation, and the centurion recognizes it. The centurion is the only one in this whole gospel who realizes that Jesus has to die even though he's the Son of God. In fact, he's the Son of God because he had to die. But Jesus, at the end, is in despair. That's Mark. Contrast that with the gospel of Luke. Luke has a completely different portrayal. In Luke's gospel, Jesus is condemned. He goes out to be crucified, but he's not silent on the way to crucifixion. He sees some women weeping by the side of the road, and he turns to them and he says, Daughters of Jerusalem, don't weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children, for the faith that's to befall you. There's nothing about him being in shock here. He's, he's worried more about these women than he is. He's going off to be crucified. He's worried about these women. He goes to the place of crucifixion, and he's not silent. They nail him to the cross, and he says, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And on the cross... He's not silent. He has an intelligent conversation with one of the other people being crucified. One of these criminals starts abusing Jesus, and the other one turns his head to the man and says, not, don't do this because we deserve what we're get, getting, but he hasn't done anything to deserve this. And he turns his head to Jesus and he says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. In Luke's gospel, Jesus knows exactly what's happening to him. He knows why it's happening to him. And he knows what's going to happen to him after it happens to him. And at the very end, the most telling thing of all, at the end, Jesus does not cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In Luke's gospel, Jesus instead says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Now, I don't remember why Jimmy Aiken didn't attack him uh, on the... Um, the fact that that's a reference to the psalm. I, I remember distinctly that he doesn't attack him on it. I, I, he might mention it, but I know he doesn't attack him on it. Uh, and I, I, I know that I watched the follow-up, the debrief that, that uh, Jimmy Aiken did, and I never got a good explanation, or at least I didn't feel I got a good explanation from him on why he didn't attack him on that. I would have. To be fair, I'm not a world-famous apologist, but I would have. Here, Jesus is calm. I was muted. Uh, I'm going to say that again. So, I remember af after this debate, I watched the debrief with Jimmy Aiken, and I never really got a good answer on why Jimmy Aiken, on the follow-up, doesn't attack him harder on the... Uh, on that being a reference to the psalm that describes Jesus' crucifixion, uh, according to Christians. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that, the, that'd that be great. Uh, let, let me finish this one, and maybe tomorrow we can set something up together if you want to do that. Is it, is it worth it? Is, is premium worth it, Tux? Let me know. Because uh, I, I got freaking uh, Steam Lab, uh, Stream Lab, and uh, it that has been worth it. Uh, it's like 140 bucks, but it it's been worth every penny. <clears throat> um, anyway, um, yeah, I don't know why Jimmy didn't hit harder on that. I, I would have, but like I said uh, in the in the muted portion from a second ago, uh, I'm not a word class uh, apologist, so Jimmy Aiken has his own means and methods and in control he understands there's no agony no despair what happens though is that people take mark's gospel 
and they take Luke's gospel, and they smash them together so that Jesus says and does everything that's in Mark and in Luke, and then they throw in Matthew, which is different, and John, which is different, and you end up with a mishmash. You have taken each individual author, and you've ignored what he's trying to tell you. You've created your own gospel in your head. You have written the gospel by combining the four. And so you end up with the seven last words. You know, and that's something that the, um, uh, the people who I call the dark magisterium uh, have been hitting really hard on their channel recently, which is in their attack against inspiration, which they call a univocal voice. I still don't like that word. Um, you know, they're, they're basically saying we're, we're, we're writing our own gospel by rewriting everything, but recontextualizing and using typology is not uh, anti-biblical. And I would even argue that hermeneutics on its own is not anti-biblical. Uh, Jimmy Aiken gives a really good warning on how to use typology properly, which is just always remember to acknowledge that the writer himself most likely didn't have any idea that Jesus existed. And if you want to be really blunt about it, didn't have any idea. So unless you're saying, you know, that somehow the, the Holy Spirit was inspiring him to know that, the mortal man who physically wrote it didn't know the information, but the Holy Spirit who inspired it did. And when we're using typology, typology has very strong limitations. So yeah, we can use typology for an argument as a supporting evidence. We cannot use it as our main evidence. And when Protestants use typological arguments, which they themselves condemn when Catholics use them, uh, they take them as, no, it, it Melchizedek is not a representation of Jesus, it's not a type of Jesus, it's actually Jesus. And when they do that, they go too far. Uh, no, uh, you know, the, the you know, anyway, it, it keeps on playing out like that over and over and over again in the Bible, where Protestants are taking an ultra-literalist uh, look and they're misinterpreting or twisting it. Uh, inspiration to mean something or typology to mean something that it can't mean on in the basis of history uh, and the basis of literature like just good healthy literature reading of these texts so yeah we we believe that it's true we believe that it's inerrant but we just mean something completely different than what the protestants mean when they say it uh, which to me means that we shouldn't be using the word inerrant because we're saying a completely different word um I don't know, maybe we use the word first or something like that in one of our documents or dogmas. But uh, like the word hell, uh, like the word, uh, there, there's plenty of words that we use that have been misinterpreted and misused and bastardized by Protestants. I think we should start using different words. Why not? Either let's go back to the Latin, so that way they can't accuse us of, of meaning what they mean, or we come up with new English words or new German words or new whatever language you want to do your biblical criticism in, criticism in so that way we're not conflating our terminology with the Protestant terminology so that way we don't look like idiots when we're debating people like Bart Ehrman. I get it that we use the terminology first. But what other people mean by inspiration and what other people mean by inerrancy and infallibility is not what Catholics or Orthodox mean. And so if they don't mean the same thing, we're talking past each other and we're confusing the lay audience and we're confusing the atheist audience and the secular scholarship who are looking at things through a Protestant lens, whether they want to or not, are screwing everything up. Because when we're talking about inspiration, they're laughing at us because they think we mean what the Protestants mean. ...of the dying Jesus. He doesn't say those seven things in any of the Gospels. He says one here, one here, one here, one here. And each one is having him say these things to make a point. And now you've chosen to ignore his point because you're thinking they're all reliable, so it all happened. I don't think that's the way to read the Gospels. I think when you do that, you're depriving each of these authors of what he has to say. They can't be all right, all correct, unless you smash them together and make each of them say something different from what they actually say. 
you're ignoring what the message is. From <laughs> I know I just ranted, so forgive this. But I wonder if you would have the same objection about people who like to put Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn into the same stories and have the same book, but they have everything that happened in Huckleberry Finn and everything that happened in Tom Sawyer happened to both characters at the same time, even though they're not the same books. But people love pairing these two characters together from Mark Twain. Does Bart Ehrman have the same objection then? Or does he object to the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen for bastardizing classic novelizations and putting them all together? Or Penny Dreadful? That's the problem. This is not a minor matter. This is not a lesser issue. Each gospel has a different presentation, and if you don't have the differences, you don't have these four gospels. I see that as a value of these gospels, not a hindrance. And if you say they're all reliable historically, then you're ignoring the messages that each one wants to give you. That's my opinion. Ha, I was ahead of it this time. Take that. Jimmy Aiken, 10 minutes for rebuttal. Let him get the PowerPoint up. There we go. So, oh, actually, that's the wrong file. Here we go. Okay. After Jimmy Aiken finishes the rebuttal, we'll close out for the night. So we got maybe another 20 to 30 minutes to go. So um, Bart has made some challenges to individual passages in the Gospels that he thinks are likely not accurate. Um, and he said that some of these are ones where uh, it's actually something important. He said major. And specifically, I was taking notes. He said, Matthew. I don't like that Jimmy Aiken stayed on the uh, slideshow presentation because uh, it showed that he's, he's too tied into whatever he wrote beforehand. And I don't think what he wrote beforehand worked. About the virgin birth and that the gospels generally disagree about the resurrection but of course that's not true matthew and luke agree that jesus was born of a virgin the points that bart thinks are erroneous are indeed lesser matters because they agree both of them make the point explicitly jesus was born of a virgin similarly all four of the gospels agree jesus was resurrected so wherever there may they may have differences it has to be on a lesser matter not one of the top line major claims but really Mm -hmm. Because we are so limited tonight in our time, you can't thrash through this subject in just a couple hours. You need to do more work. And I'm sure Bart would agree with me that if you really want to go through this, you need to do further study. And so I want to do two things that will help you with that further study. I really hate what he's about to do. I really hate what he's about to do. I, it turned me off. Uh, in the original debate, the first time, I mean, this is the original, you know what I mean? Like the first time I saw it, it is what he's about to do. Just, just did not sit with me, sit well with me at all. The first one is I have collected some resources for you on my website. And if you go to jimmyakin.com slash Bart, then you. Bart cannot respond to this he, this is a debate. He can't go and look at your research. This is a, it's a shit move. I'm right, but all my research is over there. Meanwhile, we've examined all of Bart Ehrman's books that he's ever written. This is where Jimmy Aiken lost me in the debate. I already thought he wasn't doing a good job in my original watch through. This is where I was like, fuck this. We'll find this. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll find a list. That is so childish and so insulting. I'm glad Bart had a good sense of humor about that. Of, uh, of links to different resources. And I want to call attention to the one right up at the top, because if you click on that link, here's what you find.
where Bart and I agree, because Bart agrees the Gospels are probably right on all those things we covered, and there were a bunch of them, and I agree that they're right on those things, so I like to lead with the positive, and so I wanted to show you up front where Bart This is not a response. This is not a rebuttal. At least not yet. And I agree. But of course, I, oh, and in the Where Bart and I Agree file, you'll find the claims as well as quotations from Bart, so you can see what he has to say in his own words. So you can see I'm not just making stuff up. But of course, I don't think Bart is right about everything. Uh, and so you'll also find links to things like how ancient authors wrote. Thank you, Tux. Like I said, I'm not going to do it tonight just because I, I, uh, I got a job as a, uh, uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to say what, I got a good job again. So I, I have to, tomorrow morning, I have to set up, uh, I have to open uh, for uh, this new thing. Um, so uh, I can't do it tonight, but maybe tomorrow. And I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll give you the, uh, I'll grant you the request through the Discord. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. Uh, what about the enrollment or census at Jesus' birth? That commonly comes up in such discussions. Parth brought it up before. How the infancy narratives fit together. Also, questions about Jesus' genealogies, like who is his grandfather? Um, also, uh... do you want me to advertise that in, in on the on the thing? I, I can do that right now if you want me to make an announcement for that. I know you put it in the chat, but if you want me to, I can I can make an announcement for anyone who watches this. I usually get. Uh, I've been getting most of my views now at around 10 in the morning, 10.30 in the morning. So I, if you want me to, I can promote that for you. Just let me know in the chat. Uh, what about when he was crucified and how did the different crucifixion and resurrection accounts fit together? So you can use those resources. I mean, you can read Bart's books. You can also read these to help you out in your further study. I also want to mention a few writing practices that ancient authors used because if you want to read an ancient document, you need to know what the rules were, how the author worked. And so I want to mention three different uh, writing practices that you'll find in ancient authors, including the authors of the Gospels. The first one is selection. And selection, authors had to be selective because they couldn't mention everything or everyone in their writing. So for example, Mark mentions a story where Jesus healed a blind man. But if you look at Matthew's account, Matthew mentions that there were two blind men on this occasion. And neither one of those is a mistake. They're not contradicting each other. Mark has simply selected one of the blind men to focus his story on, and Matthew selected both of them. And I've heard Bart before say that, you know, that selection and some authors including some details that are omitted by others, that's not a contradiction. Am I right, Bart? Yes. Awesome. I like being right about stuff occasionally, too. <laughs> another, uh, another ancient writing practice is para. I really do feel like if Jimmy had done a better job of, of this debate, had, uh, I don't want to say been more professional, because it's not like he's being unprofessional, but had just focused in on the actual arguments. Um, Bart doesn't seem to know what to do with Jimmy. Like He, he doesn't know what Jimmy Aiken's even doing. It, it's so bizarre to him that I think Jimmy could have won this debate if he had actually presented I don't know, an argument. Paraphrase. And uh, paraphrase refers to communicating the same meaning in different words. For example, if you go to a coworker and it's the end of the day and you tell him, the boss said we can go home now. Mimo, let's go help people customize and save with Liberty New. Damn it. That's definitely going to get me hit. There is no way that sound is not copyrighted. All right, so tomorrow morning, when I get notified, I will have to edit that out. Uh, and the processing takes, for some reason, once it's already uploaded, the, the processing takes forever. So the video might be unavailable for a while, which is going to hurt my views. Uh, but while we're streaming, I'm okay. So... But yeah, tomorrow I'm going to have to edit out that opening. The boss used those exact words, but maybe he said something else. Maybe he said, it's getting late, I'll see y'all tomorrow. Well, in that case, you've accurately reported the meaning of what your boss said, that you can go now. But you've used different words, and that's what a paraphrase is. It's communicating the same thing in different words. Another 
ancient writing practice we need to be aware of is sequencing, how authors arranged or sequenced their material. And sometimes ancient authors, like modern ones, would list things in chronological. And again, as far as I know, Bart Ehrman doesn't deny any of this. Um, the only one that I don't like and I don't agree with is the criteria of embarrassment. I think that's crap. I think that's a terrible argument that I wish people would stop using. Just like I'm glad people have stopped using the, it's so amazing, no one could make it, no one could make this up. I hate that argument. That's so stupid. Anybody can make anything up. I want, I want the criteria of embarrassment to go the way of the no one can make this up argument. Just get rid of them. But all of this stuff, I, Bart Ehrman's not disagreeing with any of this. So who, this isn't even fighting a strong man or a steel man. This is fighting a different opponent. <laughs> like, I don't, this is just fighting the wrong person. Did, did he think that him and him and uh, Bart were going to like team up and become buddies? Like, I don't, I don't understand what this is. I'm not going to disagree with you. I'm just going to attack positions you don't hold. But I'm not going to strawman you, so don't worry. I'm just attacking a different person altogether who is not here in this debate. But sometimes they would list it in some different order, like such as by topic. For example, uh, in his biography of the Roman Emperor Caligula, the Roman historian Suetonius first lists Caligula's princely deeds, and then he turns to look at Caligula's monstrous deeds. So he keeps the two categories of things together. First the princely things Caligula did, then the monstrous things Caligula did. He's using a topical ordering. We see the same kind of thing in the Gospels. For example, in Mark, Jesus first curses the fig tree, then he goes to the temple and clears it, and then they come back and see that the fig tree is withered. But Matthew, characteristically of Matthew, likes to keep stuff on the same topic together. So he's got these two stories on the topic of the fig tree. It was cursed, and then it was found withered, and so Matthew puts those together because they're on the same topic. When you are aware of these writing practices, it'll take care of the large majority of different passages where people have questioned whether the Gospels are accurate. And there's something else that's important to realize about these, which is they involve approximations. And it's important to recognize when an author is approximating rather than giving you a specific, precise detail. And again, all of this is fine. All of this is good. Should have been in the opening. But again, <coughs> I don't think Bart disagrees with any of this. So who, who, who are you rebutting? Rebut the things that Bart Ehrman said. Rebut the things that Bart Ehrman said. Let's look at a common example. It happens every day. Captain Kirk says, when will we arrive at the planet? Mr. Chekhov says, in two hours, Captain. At which point Spock says, correction, Ensign, we will arrive in one hour, 59 minutes, and 47.5 seconds. At which point... I'll tell you what, the next time I want to make a theological point on this channel, I'm going to pull out what Transformers I have left and just play with them in front of you. And then we can have a two-hour discussion about uh, Farscape. And then at the very end, I'll say something about my religious faith and hang up on you before you guys have a chance to respond. How's that sound? Oh, that wouldn't be a good idea. Oh. If only someone had told Jimmy Aiken this. Point Kirk does this because Mr. Spock has just made an error in reading Mr. Chekhov. He assumed Chekhov was being precise when really Chekhov was approximating. And notice that neither is wrong. Chekhov is not wrong in saying we're going to be there in two hours, and Spock is not wrong in saying we're going to be there a few seconds ahead of two hours. They're both just using different degrees or levels of approximation. Chekhov is giving us the gist, he's rounding off the time, whereas Spock is being precise. And so, here's why this is important to the Gospels. Ancient authors usually had to give the gist. They had no tape or video recorders. They usually had no transcripts. They had no clocks. So they had to give the In my next debate against an, not an atheist, uh, it has to be someone who like, I really disagree with really terribly, a Calvinist. I'm just going to tell them all the ways that they're correct and then agree with them during the rebuttal and use their argument, argue their points of argument 
as proof that I'm correct. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they had they had no tapes or recorders. Yeah, they, they had no transcripts. They had no clocks. And the details had to be as a just. They couldn't be proper or exact because there's no written recording. And the audience, the intended audience, wasn't expecting an accurate account. But it's reliable. <laughs> Why do Christians, why do, why do people think this is a good argument? I would be laughing in their face if it was something they were trying to convince me that I didn't agree with. You know, you know, I would date you. I would date you. Yeah, you're... You're 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 very you're very nice. You're you're, you're totally sweet, um, but you're not my type, and you're really more of a friend. And um, but I would date you. I just I won't. <laughs> how how is this? Uh, this is terrible argumentation. what happened because they didn't have the small details available to them. And as a result, their audiences typically expected just to count. Just like Captain Kirk. No, you're very handsome. I just find you completely ugly. Would expect Mr. Chekhov to give an approximation of when we get to the planet. So it's a mistake to do what Mr. Spock did and press the details of a just account because the details aren't meant to be precise. They're meant to be approximate and to convey the essence of what happened. And we all approximate. We all and Christians wonder why my channel went anti-apologetics. All give the gist. Like when you tell your coworker, the boss said we can go home now, when really he said I'll see you later. We must apply the gist principle to ancient authors, including the authors of the Gospels. They are Jimmy, I got news for you. I agree. Uh, I, I believe Jimmy Aiken agrees. I believe every atheist in the world agrees with you. Yes, you're correct. No one thinks it's an accurate account. <laughs> Thank you, Jimmy, for proving everyone who disagrees with our stance that the gospel is true. Correct. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Aiken. I'm, I'm really glad you torpedoed my channel one time by saying a writing from the Liturgy of the Hours was incorrect and that no one should watch my channel for daring to agree with something in the Liturgy of the Hours by saying they shouldn't agree with the Oxford Study Bible and that they should throw the Oxford Study Bible away. I'm, I appreciate that the same person who said that about my channel also just gave tons of ammunition for every atheist who thinks that the Bible is unreliable. not wrong for giving a gist account with approximate details they're simply using a different level of approximation that we might like because we do live in a culture filled with recording devices and word-for-word -word transcripts so what are our takeaways from this well when reading the gospels don't be mr spock don't expect more precision than the evangelists are trying to provide the evangelists are okay why not just say that and not completely torpedo the credibility of the Gospels. Why not just say what you just said without the first part? Okay. Okay. It's okay. It's, a, it's all right. It's all right. I'm, um, I'm a man alone in the desert crying out. It's fine. I'm the only one who sees this. I'm the only person who sees this. There's no other Christian or Catholic who sees the error of this argument. I must be the wrong one. ...are intending to give us gist accounts, and the important thing is that the gist is accurate. Like, we're going to be at the planet in two hours. We've seen the Gospels are right on the gist lots. 
uh, uh, Pixie, could could you expand on that? I, I want to go ahead and read that comment out loud, but I, I don't have the exact context. If you could expand on that comment, I'd greatly appreciate it. Thank you. And as long as the gist is accurate, the Gospels are doing what they are intending to do, which is give us a historically reliable account. Okay, I know he finishes saying what, what I, I want him to say, but let me, let me go back and play that part again, okay? Let me, let me, let me, let me, let, let's see if my audience, who has a better ear for this, here's what he just said. So the important thing is that the gist is accurate. Like, we're going to be a planet of two Not that part. We Here. see the Gospels are right on the gist lots. And as long as the gist is accurate, the Gospels are doing what they are intending to do. Okay, let's pretend he doesn't say the next part of the sentence. Hold on, I'm gonna I'm gonna shrink my I'm gonna I'm gonna shrink my my little photo my little picture down just a little bit. Okay, let's pretend he's not saying this part. As long as the gist is accurate, the gospels are doing what they are intending to do. You know, lie to you. <laughs> what is this? Why do people think this is good? <laughs> I'm, I'm living in wacky dacky world. That's, that's all there is to it. Viable account of the gist or essence of Jesus's life and teachings. So judged by their own standards, yes, the Gospels are historically reliable. Thank you. People in my chat, did he just argue for the historical reliability of the Gospels or the historical unreliability of the Gospels? Please let me know. Please let me know what you heard him argue for. Not what he says he argued for. Not what my fellow Catholics and fellow Christians say he argued for. What did you hear him argue for? Because I know what I heard. Now each of our participants will have uh, 10 minutes to cross-examine uh, the opponent. I believe this starts with Dr. Ernie. Yeah, well. Okay, uh, that's going to be it for tonight. We'll continue this tomorrow, assuming they don't block me from this channel. <laughs> and assuming I still have a channel, considering that some part of the Ghostbusters theme played. Uh, I'm, I'm going to give it about a minute or two to see if you all respond to, to that last question I asked. But if, if I don't see a response, I'm just going to call it a night right there. I love Jimmy Aiken. Oh, hold on. Okay. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read her, her. I'm going to read Pixie Storm's comment right now. <clears throat> Forgetting my deep-seated trust issues, people have faulty memories and are susceptible to suggestion cults and shared delusions and all sorts of things in the same way no text has ever provided uh, a record of god speaking to man only man building god i i don't ag agree with uh, pixie's final statement but i think that's a very strong point that you can make the argument and people do make the argument that it's just people's imagination. So, you know, whether you want to call a, a statue an idol or the Bible an idol, you still have an idol. Once you're imagining God, you're creating an idol because that's not actually God. The voice in your head is your voice. It's not God talking to you. It's your voice. It, remember what the Bible says. It, it's not a big thundering voice. It's not any. It's the slightest whisper of the wind. It's the thing you can't hear. It's the. That's God. It's, it's this great story. Uh, in, in, uh, all right. Pixie, I love you. Thank you for commenting that. I appreciate it. Tux, I really appreciate your offer to uh, to to do a, a Discord uh, viewing. Um, I might just end up having, now that I have a job again, I might just have to end up buying uh, a, a 
premium membership. I'm, 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 I'm not going to say anything stupid. I don't want to get my video suppressed. Oh, uh, Pixie added, uh, it's because no matter how above man they say he is, they always make him human. And not just human, but petty and on their side. I, I, I just think Jimmy Aiken made a, a, a tactical error. And I, I, I don't understand how other people don't see it. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm going to continue this analysis tomorrow. Uh, because, like I said, we're building up to Jimmy Aiken versus James White. I love Jimmy Aiken. I really dislike James White's arguments. I really want Jimmy Aiken to win. Uh, I, I believe the show is going to be, the debate is going to be on the, I looked it up. I looked it up, I looked it up, pretty cool. It's, ah, uh, they took it off. Okay, hold on. It is going to be, I just found it. And now it disappeared. I believe it said it's going to be on the 24th. Here he goes. I think I found it. There we go. So it's going to be on the 24th through the 25th. It's a two-night event. Um, it's going to be on Sola Scriptura. Uh, it's going to be the first one. Scripture is the sole infallible rule of faith for the church. And Jimmy Aiken is going to be doing the opposite argument that he's doing here. Uh, and then the next uh, argument is going to be, how does one find peace with God? And that's going to be Jimmy Aiken versus James White. I want Jimmy Aiken to win both of these arguments. I am a Catholic. I just think this was a terrible argument. And I don't want to see him make these mistakes with James White because James White is not nice like Bart Ehrman is. James White will not give you this amount of latitude. And I don't want to see uh, Jimmy Aiken, who I do think is the best apologist we have, uh, get his butt kicked by a guy who I think is a jerk and a bully and a liar and a manipulator. So... On the other hand, it's two apologists fighting each other, and this channel is dedicated to anti-apologetics, so it might work out, <laughs> even if uh, even if it doesn't doesn't sound good. Uh, I love you all. God bless. Remember, forgive everyone for everything. Uh, God forgives you, so you forgive yourself and um, forgive your enemies, and uh, have patience. I love you all. Good night.